Thanks be to God. Thank you, Phaedra, for that reading. But now we have to talk about the Trinity because it is Trinity Sunday. Odds are, if you've ever heard a talk about the Trinity, it was on Trinity Sunday. I don't think we talk about the Trinity any other day. I think the framers who put together the liturgical calendar knew Trinity to be too important to risk being avoided by anyone, and yet so challenging that it was likely to be avoided by many, except that they were to put it in the liturgical calendar. So this morning's reading had a double, has a double challenge for us. It's one of the few articulations of the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in that formula. Ha doesn't happen very often in Scripture. But it also contains an injunction from the risen Christ for us to go forth and to baptise others in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there's kind of two challenges that we're going to look at this morning. The first thing to recognise, I think, about the Trinity is that it is actually beyond us to fully grasp what it means. I admire those who do their best to ex explicate the inexplicable, I think is what they're doing there. The notion of three in one has drawn forth a multitude of metaphors each one hinting at aspects of this mystery and at the same time falling well short of making it plain to us because there is no making plain this mystery of Trinity. Three unique and indissoluble persons together not as three gods but as one God. We must resort to poetry and metaphor because there's no complete analogue of this at all in all of creation. And the temptation is to, sim is to simplify the idea, to make it more like something with which we are already familiar. But to do so would be to confine God within the limits of what we have come to see and understand so far. And there really are some things that actually become less worthwhile the more we think we understand them. And I think Trinity is one of those things. And even should we begin to glimpse a way of constructing an understanding of this three-in-one nature of our God, there is still a greater challenge, and that is the struggle we have to believe that it's actually possible. Like it's one thing to construct a conceptual form of understanding, but the most crucial element of the fully other-centeredness that is the oneness of the Trinity is very hard for us to come at. So the Trinity is three persons who are centered on the others. And so it's this very dynamic thing that's pretty hard for us to really get hold of. We might glimpse it in moments. There are moments when we experience self-giving or the giving of self to another. For example, in a healthy, mature marriage, very few of those around, but there are some, and in them you have two persons, neither of whom cease to be persons in their own right, but who covenant with each other to become one. It's as though they share the one heart, the one desire, the one intent. But as anyone who's been married for more than about 10 minutes knows, this does tend to be confined to moments rather than an ongoing, constant reality. Of course, there's self-giving in the, raising, the healthy raising of children. For many years, when I was much younger, uh, my parents had a very tight budget and they couldn't afford to feed the family meat. So they went without meat so that us kids could eat meat. They were self-giving in that way. And yet, at the same time, in all sorts of other ways, my parents, not by design but inadvertently, were quite neglectful of us in certain ways. So it's not a perfect analogy. In extreme circumstances of natural disaster or war, there are incidents of people who rise to the equally extreme demands of love 
in those circumstances. And it's extraordinary to see what people will do under pressure for others at times. But for that depth and quality of love to be constantly and continually alive in a kind of dynamic stasis, so much paradox, is beyond most of our capacities to believe. It is too much for us to come at. Even if we can conceive of the possibility, we find it difficult to believe it could be a reality. And yet, I think that's one of the most important things that the Trinity offers to us. Trinity holds out to us a beautiful reality that is beyond our everyday experience. And thereby the Trinity calls us forth in a very particular direction. Like so many things to do with God, it's beyond everything we know or experience in our normal daily lives. And that's not to say we don't know anything about it, because those realities of the Trinity, as I said before, we glimpse them. We glimpse them in healthy relationships. We glimpse them in moments. But the notion that the Trinity... The notion, the, help, sorry, the notion of the Trinity helps us to appreciate what those glimpses of this kind of love mean. And the belief in the Trinity helps us to hope more that there might be more robust expressions of that kind of love in our life and in our everyday lives together. It's a bit like scientists, I think. You know how scientists work? They come up with a theory about something might be from evidence that they've gleaned so far, or it might just be a thought that they get, and then they construct experiments to test whether their theory is true. So the theory, the concept, leads them in a very particular direction, and then their action goes towards that. They test, well, if this idea is true, then if I do this and this, and that should be the outcome, and that's the scientific method. So the idea draws the scientists in a particular direction. And I think the Trinity functions like that for the believer. We have this notion of a God in community, one God, three persons, beyond our understanding, but it draws our life in a very particular direction. So Trinity is most certainly beyond us. And yet it is also somewhat near us. There are aspects of the Trinity that we can observe and relate to and know in a very profound way. So I want to suggest that the work of the Father is observable. We can look at the account of God's people through the sweep of history and we can see that God has been at work. Of course, it's not straightforward. We're peering back through time and using the lenses of historical documents and sacred texts and archaeological discoveries and social impacts and those kinds of things are vague and need to be interpreted. But that's the same way we learn of things like the Egyptian pharaohs or Socrates or Julius Caesar. We look at the material produced both by them and about them and we observe the impact they have had on the development of human history. And we can discern, as it were, a kind of fingerprints on the world. These are things we are accustomed to observing when we seek to understand the meaning of the past. And we can observe the same things when it comes to the hand of God in the history of God's people. It would seem otherwise impossible to account for the extraordinary things that happened in the history of this tiny displaced nation of the Jews. The reality of the Trinity is not only observable, but we can also relate to it. When God came among us in the person of Jesus, he came not as one who was aloof in power or distant by virtue of social position. Jesus became a tradesperson, upper middle class, you'd probably say, very much among the people. And he caused a stir because of his capacity in his social and religious context to move very freely amongst the people. He was at ease with everyone he related to, from the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests in the temple, through to debating the Pharisees in their theological constructs of dominant notions of holiness, all the way through to those who were 
prostitutes or tax gatherers or regarded as particularly sinful. To them he spoke forgiveness and demonstrated welcome. This is Trinity, up close and personal, a God who draws near to us that we might draw near to God. But not just observable and not simply relatable, our God in three persons is also profoundly knowable. Not in the sense of knowing about or being taught ideas about, like God in history kind of stuff, but knowable like we know our dearest love or our closest friend. The person of the Spirit in the Trinity not only acts in history but comes close to us in ways that are really profound. The Holy Spirit moves among us and within us. We're not merely allowed to know about our God, we're invited to know and be known by our God more profoundly than we know any other or are known by any other. St. Paul would tell us that the Spirit intercedes with our own spirit. He says in Romans, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. That's in Romans 8, towards the end. Like a compassionate friend who is not simply patient with us as we go through the ups and downs of our life, but who really gets what's going on and has empathy for us. This is how the Spirit knows us and how we're invited to know the Spirit. One of the things I appreciate about, appreciate about the way in which this story is told is that it includes an important detail about the fact that whilst some worshipped Jesus when they saw him risen, some were doubtful. If Matthew's Gospel was a propaganda pamphlet, I doubt that it would have included such a detail. Today, in some Christian circles, it's a cultural no-no to acknowledge doubt of any kind at all. The emphasis is on positive faith to the exclusion of anything outside that very narrow bandwidth. Now, we know that faith is not the same as certitude. Certitude is the editing out of anything that we have decided does not fit within the way we'd like to tell the story. It presents as if it's rock solid, this certitude. There are no chinks or gaps allowed, and yet it is brittle to the slightest exposure of truth that does not fit neatly into the tightly organized narrative construction. And that is not faith in God. That is faith in the strength of the power to tell your particular story. Faith in God has built into it an awareness that we do not see everything clearly as yet. We do not yet know all that we will know. Faith in God has flex to allow for new revelation. And here I have to grasp for a really odd kind of metaphor, but it came to mind, Goblin Steel. Are you familiar with the Harry Potter? Or I think it's true in the Lord of the Rings as well. Goblin Steel, it said, draws in anything that makes it stronger. So uh, the, the sword of Gryffindor in the Harry Potter stories is made of Goblin Steel. And it's, it, if you kill something nasty with it, it draws that strength into it and becomes stronger. Well, I think faith in God responds to the challenges that we encounter in a way that makes us stronger and makes our faith stronger. Because trusting that God is yet greater than whatever it is that we are facing at the time, even if our understanding at the time can't cope, we can trust that God is larger than that. And our faith becomes stronger as we relinquish our current understanding in the anticipation of a more nuanced and useful appreciation of an even fuller reality. In this way, our faith in God 
takes on only that which makes it stronger. And so even though some doubted, they came and they saw Jesus and they encountered that and they were strengthened. And as a consequence, we're propelled out beyond what we have known up until now. Faith in the triune God sends us forth to places and to undertake activities that we've never before encountered. Phaedra's never read the Bible in our church before. New experience. That's what faith in the triune God does. We're not constrained to repeat endlessly the same old ritual pathways of habit that life up until now consisted of or previous gener generations trod over and over again. Rather, we allow the truth of the tradition to form us and equip us to respond to the, in new and more helpful ways to the challenges that present to us today. And this is why the followers of Jesus did not all become carpenters, right? That wasn't the truth that they were being called to follow. Rather, the followers of Jesus are those who give themselves for others. They are those who place their hope not within the timeline of a single life, but who hope in all eternity. To be one who accepts the triune God is to be one who lives larger than merely oneself. It is to appreciate the interconnectedness of all people and that the true well-being for any calls for the well-being of all. And this is the only salvation for our world, I believe. In an age where we not only have the technology to literally destroy the world utterly, should someone be sufficiently hell-bent on the idea, we also face the very real danger of damaging our environment so thoroughly that we inadvertently render the planet unlivable by our poor stewardship and sheer self-centeredness. And salvation will only be achieved by active engagement. There is no hope in passivity. Just as there are parts of the church where doubt is not allowed to be present, there are also other parts of the church that appear to be incapable of any conviction at all. And this is like a toxic form of niceness sometimes. We so internalize our fear of causing offense to anyone that we lose our capacity to stand anywhere with conviction. Yet, if we opt to go with the flow, which is what happens when all anchors are relinquished and conviction is avoided, the scripture is very clear, we will flow to our destruction. It is not merely incumbent upon us to make daily choices toward discipleship, it is our only hope. And this means going about our life in a manner that is distinctly against the flow. It means being a disciple of Jesus, baptized into the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and by our deeds and words, inviting others to join our God along with us. If there be no change, if there is no repentance, no turning toward a new and living way, then most certainly we are lost. Personally, I'm kind of glad the framers of the liturgical calendar saw fit to dedicate a Sunday to this cumbersome theological construct we know as the Trinity. Otherwise, I doubt I would choose to go near the subject. It's just a bit too tricky. I can observe that when I do go near the subject, looking into the Trinity always asks something more of me. It draws me deeper into the mystery of God. We see the Father alive in the history of God's people. We relate to the Son in the person of Jesus. And we know the intimacy of the deep connection through the Holy Spirit. One God in three persons. It cannot be simplified or reduced to something that makes more familiar sense to us. Our God is three persons, distinct, indissoluble, eternally three. 
and yet one, unified, indissoluble, eternally one. This triune God meets us where we are, transforms us in the deepest places of our beings and sends us forth to be transformative in the world. In one sense, the Great Commission really is great because it is from and in and toward the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, our triune God. Amen. Happy Trinity Sunday.